this chapter, Marx further analyzes some technical aspects of the inner workings of accumulation, while also continuing the discussion from the previous chapter on how labor power is reproduced for each cycle and how these two processes are interlinked. The composition of capital is to be understood in a twofold sense. On the side of value, it is determined by the proportion in which it is divided into constant capital or value of the means of production and variable capital or value of labor power, the sum total of wages. On the side of material, as it functions in the process of production, all capital is divided into means of production and living labor power. In this section, Marx introduces us to the concept of the composition of capital. What Marx means by composition here is the relationship between the means of production needed for accumulation, the amount of workers needed that actually work on those means of production, and the capital that must be invested into these two things, and how this relationship between them, or composition, can shift and change. While Marx notes that the composition of individual businesses or entire branches of industry can be analyzed, he's only really interested here in the total composition of an entire society or the total social capital. With that said, he introduces us to three different ways of understanding composition. The first is value composition. This is essentially the ratio of the investment of society's total capital that is split between constant capital, investment in the means of production, and variable capital, investment in labor power. So, for an example, we could say that the value composition of a society's investment into these two things is an even ratio or an equal share. The next is technical composition. This is the relation to the total mass or amount of society's physical means of production and the total mass or amount of society's physical workers needed to work on them. If, for example, society increased the amounts of machinery it has above the amount of relative amount of workers it has employed or an uneven ratio between the means of production and the workers using them, we could say that it has an increase to its technical composition. The third is organic composition. This is essentially the relationship that the technical composition has on the value composition. For example, the increase in technical composition that I described in the previous example of an increase to society's machinery over the amount of relative employed workers would also be reflected by an increase in the constant capital that would have to be invested in by society to actually obtain that increase in the means of production. This relationship of changes from the technical composition and its reflection in the value composition, Marx calls the organic composition. A rise in the price of labor as a consequence of accumulation of capital only means in fact that the length and weight of the golden chain the wage worker has already forged for himself allows a relaxation of the tension of it. In this first section, Marx is going to assume that all three compositions we just discussed are equal and remain the same. What this means is that as capitalists invest, their money buys proportionately both more means of production and more labor power. So as capital grows, its demand for labor power increases at the same speed. The faster capital grows, the faster the demand for workers. With this relationship, the increasing demand by capitalists and their needs for workers puts pressure on them in their competition towards other capitalists, as they need to lure labor and more skilled workers to their business to continue to accumulate with growing production and new technological developments, and the price of labor power or wages increases. 
When this happens, capital can now pay the higher wages, as, as we discussed in chapter 17, increased wages still allow for increased profits, thus still allowing for accumulation to occur. Essentially, capital is still gaining an increase of total surplus value, even if the percentage rate is just a little less. However, as we discussed in chapter 15, capitalism's growth is elastic in its nature and tends to expand and shrink depending on many various factors, what we now call business cycles. Eventually, this period of increased growth slows down and actually leads to shrinking profits, which means that less surplus value can be used for accumulation. So less investment in the means of production occur, meaning there's also now less demand for labor power. And so the price of labor power or wages falls back down. Something we should also note is that in this ebbing and flowing or rising and falling of wages, which is structurally part of capitalism itself, Marx sees one possibility for revolution. Not only do these shrinking profits cause a crisis for the structure of capitalism as it struggles to accumulate, but the shrinking of wages also causes social unrest amongst the workers who begin to struggle to survive. Increased wages during periods of rapid accumulation may loosen that tension for a little while, providing the workers with a little more material wealth. But at some point, that tension is going to increase again, pulling the worker and that wealth via their wage back down. Instead of becoming more intensive with the growth of capital, this relation of dependence only becomes more extensive. The sphere of capital's exploitation and rule merely extends with its own dimensions and the number of its subjects. One other point we should also note here is that when Marx is talking about the accumulation of capital or growth, he's not meaning it in the purely economical development sense that economists usually speak of. He's actually discussing the accumulation of class relationships that these moments of growth produce. The expansion of capital then is the expansion of the social terms of reproduction and class divisions that creates more or bigger capitalists on one side and more and more wage laborers on the other. The first hint to his uh, specific approach we can find already in the subtitle of Capital. The subtitle is Critique of Political Economy. Both these economic factors bring about in the compound ratio of the impulses they reciprocally give one another, that change in the technical composition of capital, by which the variable constituent becomes always smaller and smaller as compared with the constant. Marx now stops assuming that the compositions discussed in the previous section are fixed at an equal amount, and instead analyzes them through the context of relative surplus value. As we discussed in part four and the previous chapter, increases to productivity continually causes the cheapening of the means of production. So during cycles of accumulation, the constant capital that is invested into the means of production obtains more physical amounts of these objects for a continually lesser price. Similar to our example in the previous chapter, society's total capital can maybe now buy 1,000 hat-making machines for the same price as it could previously only buy 800. As we discussed in chapter 15, this also means a reduction in the number of workers needed to be employed, as the increased use of machinery now replaces them. What we see then is a change in the relationships of the compositions of capital. The technical composition here has increased, more means of production and lesser labor power. This also changes the value composition. There's an increase to the investment in constant capital for that increase of means of production and a lowering of variable capital for lesser labor power. Also, 
Now, due to the lesser labor power used, more capital can actually be further invested into constant capital instead. So constant capital increases while variable capital decreases. The organic composition of this is that even though the constant capital is increasing, the rate at which it increases is actually slower than the rapid speed at which the physical mass of means of production are increasing. Essentially, its total value is growing, but slower than the expansion of the individual elements within. A growing amount of lots and lots and lots of increasingly cheaper and cheaper means of production. While at the same time, a decline in the variable capital used and a decrease in the number of workers employed. Marx also shows in a brief historical sketch how the organic composition has changed and shifted over many periods of capitalist development. However, further analysis of this is left for discussions in Volume 3. A certain accumulation of capital in the hands of individual producers of commodities forms therefore the necessary preliminary of the specifically capitalistic mode of production. As we've seen throughout the entire book, as accumulation continues and grows, more and more of this growing mass of cheaper and cheaper means of production tend to concentrate into the hands of individual capitalists. For their production to grow, they must continually obtain further increases in the means of production to do so. Expanded production means the capitalist now owns more machines, more buildings, more tools, etc. And they also must obtain ever increasing supplies of raw materials and the access and transportation of them. This means that individual capitalists tend to break off part of their capital into smaller capital to invest in new areas of production whether it's for the production of a new type of commodity, new workers to exploit, or to gather more raw materials. However, this growing capital is still owned and linked to the same capitalist and their original capital. Marx refers to this as the concentration of capital. Another tendency of capital is its need to centralize the coercive laws of competition between individual capitalists in their need for increased profits drive them to try and remove their competition and or take control of the operations of other capitalists through buyouts and takeovers. Marx refers to this as the centralization of capital. This allows individual capitalists to do various things. It allows them to gain a monopoly on whatever commodities they are producing, which then further allows them to outcompete other smaller capitalists and sell their commodity for whatever price they like. And with buyouts or takeovers of different factories, businesses or areas of production, it also allows capitalists to obtain further or different production methods and technologies from different capitalists. Another aspect of this is that as larger capitalists continually take over the businesses of the smaller, this also then forces the smaller capitalists into new unexploited or unexplored areas of production as they try to find new ways to grow and compete against the larger capitalists. Marx also notes that the centralization of capital also allows larger capitalists to begin acting as a creditor, which, with the use of loans and debts, they can leverage over other capitalists. However, this is also a topic left for Volume 3. An interesting point should also be noted here, that as the larger capitalists outcompete the smaller capitalists, making them bankrupt or unable to continue to afford to run their business, it makes those smaller capitalists unemployed, throwing them onto the labour market, as they must now try to find work for themselves. But in time, the old capital 
also reaches the moment of renewal from top to toe, when it sheds its skin and is reborn like the others in a perfected technical form, in which a smaller quantity of labor will suffice to set in motion a larger quantity of machinery and raw materials. We can observe in both the concentration and centralization of capital two things. Firstly, it allows the capitalist to incorporate many labor-saving techniques. The joining together of many workers from various businesses now allows for greater cooperation of labor so that production becomes more efficient and allows to some extent a reduction in the future labor power that needs to be employed. Also, certain jobs that would have been performed by different people across multiple businesses now only need to be performed by a fewer amount of people as these businesses become merged into one. This also then throws a certain amount of those previously employed back onto the labor market. Secondly, as they concentrate and centralize, so does the machinery and technology that is used. So now not only does an individual capitalist own a greater quantity of machinery than before, but the combining together of this machinery and techniques of divisions of labor in technology itself allows for much greater efficiency in its use. This increase in the machinery basis, as we've already seen, also means a decrease in the labor power that needs to be employed as workers lose their jobs to these machines. And while concentrated capital does expand and opens up new areas of production, these typically only attract a small amount of workers due to these businesses often being much smaller in scale. What we see then is that as capital accumulates, it is necessary for it to concentrate and centralize into the hands of fewer and fewer capitalists. However, at the same time, its tendency is to make more and more workers unemployed, while simultaneously attracting less and less.